Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Chapel again. My name is Joshua Manning, uh, pastor here. I'm so glad that you guys are here with us in worship. Um, God is good. And all the time. Let's go. Listen. Uh, uh, can we just give our band a hand? Just give our band a hand. Uh, and, and give God thanks for them um, and the ways in which God uses them to minister to us. Uh, God is good, and I'm so glad that we all know it's all the time, even when it looks like uh, life is kind of difficult. Uh, it is the first Sunday in Lent. Yeah, I'm just as excited as you are, I promise. <laughs> um, but it's the first Sunday in Lent, and that means a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, Lent is a season of preparation, a season in which we prepare ourselves, not just for Easter Sunday, but it is a season in which we prepare ourselves to be co-conspirators with God against our plans. This, ser this sermon series is called Divine Disruption, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means, but... Uh, some of you in the room probably didn't respond well when I said it's Lent because you may have had a similar experience that, as I did in which I did not grow up observing the season of Lent. I grew up in a Pentecostal tradition. That means we were not very liturgical. We did not follow the Christian calendar. Some of you may be familiar with the tradition I grew up in. I grew up in the Church of God in Christ. Uh, let me rephrase that. The hand clapping, feet stomping, tongue talking, Pentecostal uh, Church of God in Christ in which we told people you can't just join in, you got to be born in. Sounds like a cult, doesn't it? I promise it's not. All right, so, um, <clears throat> but all jokes aside, so I didn't grow up celebrating Lent, but over the past 10 years or so, I have been acquainting myself with this season of preparation. 40 days where we recommit ourselves to foundational spiritual practices such as prayer, fasting, and study of scripture. Uh, Lent officially begins on Ash Wednesday, and I know some of you weren't here, uh, and if you didn't have an opportunity to join us online, I want to invite you to review that service, and hopefully you will have a renewed perspective on fasting. I don't know about you, but it was very helpful for me uh, to think about fasting not only as a way of self-denying, but self-denying so that I and you can have more to share. So... Um, Hopefully, if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that, please look at that. Um, but again, we're starting this sermon series on divine disruption. I think Lent, again, is an opportunity for us to work with God, to cooperate with God against our own plans. Um, and I'll say something more about that later. But I think a good place for us to start this Lenten journey as a community of faith is to set a goal for what we can expect at the end of these 40 days. Not what we can expect during these 40 days, because I know what we can expect during these 40 days. Um, most of the time it's to be hungry or feel like we're hungry because the clock says it's time to eat or miss sugar and sweets or soda. Some of y'all are Dr. Pepper fanatics. I'm not judging you. There's no judgment here. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> um, and so if you have not considered yet what you might abstain from for Lent, um, Please, please, please consider that. But the early Christians used the season of Lent as a way of preparing themselves for baptism, which for them was an outward sign of their commitment to live this faith out in community to the best of their ability, and dare I say, beyond their ability. And with that in mind, I want to pose this question to you. At the end of these 40 days, or remaining 30 plus, where do you hope to be spiritually? When Lent is all said and done, where do you hope to be spiritually? It's okay if you, if you haven't thought about it yet because Jesus has answers. We're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Listen now for a word from the Lord. 
Oh, and just as a heads up, we were reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Somebody asked me this recently, and I never tell you guys. We're reading from the New Revised Standard Version. So if you're looking on your phone and the words are not the same, it's because you're probably in the wrong translation. Wrong. Not you. Not you. I said, like, not, like, not wrong, like something's wrong with you. <laughs> just not the same as this one. I, I was like, I know I'm shady, but you guys had to really stop. I said, you really had to stop. I was like, I'm not, I'm not always trying to be uh, rude. So anyway. The New Revised Standard Version is the version that we use here. Amen. Okay. Um, then Jesus said, when Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command the angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to be in worship with one another, to experience the joy of your presence. Lord, as we prepare to hear more words from you, may you open up our hearts and our minds to receive what your spirit is saying to the church. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. God, as I prepare to speak, allow me to play the background as you take center stage. Not my words, but your words. Not my will, but your will be done. Holy Spirit, have your way. Speak into our lives. Speak into our situations. Speak to our circumstances. Speak to the things that we are holding close, that we do not have the courage to share. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So Lent, 40 days of preparation, 40 days of fasting, 40 days of praying. And so I just want to start here. What makes Lent a season of preparation as opposed to being a season of expectation, right? In the season of Advent, we spend time anticipating the arrival of the Christ child. And Lent feels similar for those of us as Christians, as Kim shared in her prayer earlier, we know the end. It's because we know the end of the story. It feels like a season of expectation. It feels like we are anticipating the celebration of the resurrection. And yet, I think what Jesus models here is super important. After Jesus is baptized, he goes into the wilderness and is tested after his 40 days of fasting. For 40 days, he's wandering around the wilderness and then he is tested. So I think the first thing that we can expect at the end of this Lenten journey is for the real challenge to begin. I know for many of us, it feels like Lent is a season filled with challenges and it indeed is filled with challenges. But choosing to pray more regularly, choosing to read more regularly, choosing to abstain from consuming certain forms of media or consuming certain foods or, dare I say, beverages, is challenging. And yet, after 40 days of not eating, of not drinking, here Jesus is being tested. One of the challenges here is that Jesus is invited into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. 
hard stop. God loves us. Right? I think all of us can agree on that. God loves us. And yet, how does Jesus find himself following the Holy Spirit into hostile territory? In another version of the story in the Gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus was in the wilderness with wild beasts, which meant that his life was in danger. <laughs> but he didn't wander there on his own. It was an invitation from the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we believe that because God invited us on a journey that is going to be easy or that there are not going to be challenges or better yet, watch this, that there will be no opposition. Yet, Jesus is invited into an environment that is not conducive for his well-being. Not of his own volition, but by the Holy Spirit. What was supposed to happen? What was Jesus going to learn from being there? I believe that there are some things we can learn in life through receiving information. And there are other things that can only be learned through experience. There are some things that we can learn in life by receiving information. Other things can only be learned by experiencing. I don't know about y'all, but when I was younger, my parents used to tell me, you'll learn more when you get older or it'll make sense to you when you get older. And I didn't believe them. But now, I do. When my dad used to go through the house trying to turn all the lights off, I didn't understand it. But now, I do. I didn't understand why he didn't want us running water or any of those other things. But now I do. When my mom would say, stop driving up and down like you pay for your own gas, I didn't understand it. But now... I do. Or my favorite, we have food at home. I didn't understand it. Oh, but now I do. Some things can only be learned through experience. So I want to talk briefly about how Jesus responds to each of these invitations from the tempter. So we know this. For 40 days, he's in in hostile territory. And not only is he in hostile territory, when the tempter and the tester finally comes, he is exhausted. The man is hungry. The test only comes when he's at his absolute worst. It doesn't come when he has all the energy to handle it, to think straight, all the nutrients he needs. It only comes when he absolutely is probably under-functioning. Doesn't life often feel like that at times? Are you getting kicked when you're already down? If it's not one thing, it's another, or better yet, when it rains, it pours. And Jesus has been 40, spent 40 days in the wilderness preparing himself, um, or dare I say, being prepared for this very moment, for the challenge that was going to come when he was already at his worst. And so, as the tempter is Asking Jesus these questions, Jesus responds to the temptation the same way these three times. He says, it is written. It is written. And I know for many of us in this room, we struggle with the authority of Scripture. We struggle with the authority of Scripture. And it might seem like a cop out of sorts. Mostly because we have experienced Christians who are really good at telling us that thou shalt not without ever telling us what we should be doing. And because of that, we have sort of shied away from engaging scripture with the type of reverence that Jesus utilizes it with here. But we know Jesus for ourselves and know that Jesus is not that type of person. Jesus is not interested in just utilizing the scripture to beat people down or to make himself feel better. Here, he's using it as a source of strength. Here's what I think happened over the 40 days. I think Jesus, like many of us, had some experience with catechism. 
That is to say, he learned the faith from a very young age. And I don't know about you, when I was in Sunday school, we had memory verses, which meant we had to remember different parts of scripture. And so I think Jesus very similarly had a good memory. He knew the words, remembered the words, and yet something else needed to happen. You know, the late Reverend Dr. Gardner C. Taylor was a well-known Baptist preacher in New York City, um, and he was a civil rights advocate. He was also referred to as the Dean of American Preaching. And Gardner Taylor was known for having a good memory. He would get up and preach and preach as if he had his manuscript in the back of his head. Never, ever look down. Thank God for Gardner Taylor, because I'm not about to do that. But all jokes aside, um, and when someone asked him how he memorized his sermons, he responded emphatically by saying that he did not memorize his sermons at all, that he aimed to internalize them. And some of you have probably heard me say this before. He said it this way, I don't memorize, I internalize. And I think what happens here for us is over these 40 days, what Jesus had remembered from being a child was becoming transcribed in his heart. The words that were here became etched in his heart. And so my hope for some of us during this season of Lent is that the words we read won't just become points of conversation or points of contention, but instead would become words that are transcribed onto our hearts so that when we do respond to situations and challenges, we can respond with it is written not because we are copping out, but because we have learned that there is value in these words. That the words are indeed, watch this, redeemable. No matter who taught us or mistaught us, these words are redeemable. So Jesus transcribes them onto his heart. It's the difference between memorization and internalization. The testimonies of his predecessors became his own. I shared this a couple of weeks ago on morning prayer um, about my grandfather. When Jace was born, I kind of just sat there and like kept exchanging words with him. Like he's an infant, right? Newborn. He doesn't have words to give back. But it was sort of a blessing. It was a blessing of sorts. Um, and I kept sharing with him all these things that I learned from my predecessors in the faith. And the one phrase I've learned that I will never, ever forget is from my grandfather. He said these words. Um, Every time I would call him and say, all right, Grandpa, I'm going to see you for Christmas. Or Grandpa, I'm going to see you for Thanksgiving. Or I'll see you tomorrow. I'll call, call you next week. My grandfather would say, Lord willing. Some of y'all were on morning prayer. He would say, Lord willing. And I would say, yeah, Grandpa, can't you just believe that God is going to wake you up tomorrow? And I learned it wasn't about what God was going to do or not do. It was about taking for granted the fact that God was active. And that as human beings, we don't really have much certainty. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the future holds. But we can take solace in this fact that we know who holds the future, that we know who holds the future. So Jesus, I believe in this experience is moving from memorization to internalization. I also think there's something else that I would like to see happen in my own life. And I pray for all of you at the end of this Lenten journey. And that is, I will learn the difference between strength and endurance. Strength and endurance. Um, I think sometimes the best way 
to outlast opposition or outlast challenges is not to fight harder, but sometimes it is about outlasting the challenge. Sometimes you don't have the strength to fight. Remember, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He is tired. He has no, he had nothing to eat. He has no energy. He's famished, as the scripture says. And yet, still has to figure out how to outlast his opposition. Because the opposition wants for him to succumb to these invitations to live into something other than what he knows. Makes me think of the words from the Apostle Paul that he wrote to the church in Rome He wrote these words in Romans 5, 3 through 5. He says, and not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Paul says, I know it's challenging right now, but here is the good news about challenges. That they help us learn how to remain steadfast. For as long as this challenge remains, I will continue to walk. I will continue to inch forward. You may not be able to keep the same pace that you kept at different stages of life. Especially here during Lent. If you are fasting, you may have a little bit less energy than other times. If there's something happening in your life that is affecting your ability to operate at the pace you're normally able to operate at. Paul says, in our afflictions, we learn endurance. And by enduring, we develop character. The goal of the Christian faith is not what God can do for you. Say it again. The goal of the Christian faith is not to figure out what God can do for you. You know what the goal of Christian faith is? It's one word, transformation. That you and I will become more like Christ. And what Jesus experiences during this journey is transformation. Words that he memorized became words on his heart and in his heart. Battles that he did not know how to fight or he was not equipped to fight. He learned that he did not need to fight, but he needed to outlast. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing in your life. But sometimes, only thing you can do is not give up. And it doesn't mean it's going to be pretty. Uh, we have a new bishop in the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. And uh, I've been in a couple of different meetings with him. And he says very often uh, that... <laughs> He loves leaders who lead unspectacularly. There we go. Unspectacularly. And I thought about that when reflecting on Jesus' words. There is nothing pretty about, if this is a win, there's nothing pretty about this. The only thing he can say is, as it is written. The the, the tempter is like, ah, if you're really the son of God, take this and turn it into food for you to eat. He's like, ah, as it is written. As it is written. Everything's as it is written. And eventually musters up the strength to dismiss his opposition. And he goes from simply enduring the challenges and making his way through it to straight up resisting. He goes and says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not. You know, it makes me think about uh, peer pressure. Um, but before I get to peer pressure, let me start here. I grew up in New York. I know y'all know this because I keep saying it. Um, but because I grew up in New York, I, for those of you who have visited New York, there are a lot of people selling uh, goods, both authentic and counterfeit, <laughs> on the streets. Right? I know you guys have seen it in movies and TV. Some of y'all have been. Some of y'all lost money because you didn't know to say no. 
okay? <laughs> uh, but all jokes aside, um, and every time I found myself as a young person, a younger person, <laughs> y'all got it, okay. Um, I found myself being confronted by someone who said, hey, do you want to buy the new, this new CD or this new movie on DVD? You know, my response was never no thank you. You know what my response was? I'm good. I'm good. What I think happens here is that Jesus is responding similarly by saying, I'm good. Wouldn't it be better for you if you weren't hungry? I'm good. Wouldn't it be better for you if you had power? I'm good. Wouldn't it be better for you if you had riches? And Jesus is like, I'm good. I'm good. One of my hopes for this Lenten journey is at the end of these 40 days, I will have the strength to endure and resist the way Jesus did. Because there's something very strange about the fact that the Holy Spirit invites him into hostile territory and then leaves him to fight this battle by himself. Something very strange about that to me. And for many of us, I think sometimes when we go through challenges, it feels like God has indeed abandoned us. Like God is nowhere to be found. Or better yet, that God put us in that mess. And Jesus just says, I'm good. I'm good with where God has placed me. I'm good with where God has placed me. Well, don't you want more money? No. Don't you want a nicer car? No. Don't you want better food? Jesus is like, no. And how many of us can say with confidence that we are good with where God has placed us? That we're good. That we are content. And that, better yet, we cannot be swayed. Because my favorite thing about the second question is that the tempter begins to utilize scripture to invite Jesus to do something other than what he had been called to. I don't know about y'all, but I'm a preacher. So I spend a lot of times in rooms with people who try to invite me to see it the way they would as if God. Let me just say it this way. Just because someone said God did doesn't mean God did. Just because someone utilized the words in this book to make a very good point doesn't mean that the point will stand. Does this make sense? Are y'all following me? Okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm here in the the right room this morning. Um, I'm good. I'm good where God has placed me. So my prayer for you is that the words that you hear, whether sung or spoken on Sunday mornings through this season, or the words you read each day, the prayers that you pray in the morning prayer group will become transcribed in your heart. That they won't just stay in your brain, but that it will become a part of your being. And when you are tempted, that you can choose what God has invited you to. What God has invited you to. And sometimes people think they're helping us by saying God would never allow you to suffer like that. But what we learn here was that God did not bring suffering to Jesus. 
in this situation. God did not bring suffering. God invited Jesus, the Holy Spirit invited Jesus on a journey. <laughs> and isn't life such a journey that we don't know what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen when we say yes to being with God, when we're saying yes to being in certain relationships, when we're saying yes to certain job offers. We don't know what to expect. We just say yes and go on about our business. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I said yes to things that when I started living through it, I was like, ah, I wish I would have said no. <laughs> I wish I would have said no because I didn't know it was going to be like this. My prayer for you is that as you go through these things, you can respond by saying, I'm good. You know, for me, um, as I was thinking about this, I came back to a gospel song from the early 90s, which is based off a hymn. The song is called Silver and Gold. It's called Silver and Gold. Yeah, I'll sing it. I hear hear a couple people say, sing it, sing it, sing it. Sorry. (laughs) Very short piece. Silver and gold, silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Nor fame or fortune, nor riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus then silver and gold. But here's the reminder. Is that even when I'm invited to something that looks shinier or more stable or more certain, I can stand on the truth of God's love as it is modeled through the incarnation that Jesus is proof that God loves us. And further, Jesus is proof, guess what, that God is with us and that God does not abandon us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.